Well, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know, since the very beginning of this year, right, we've been uh, making our Sunday messages from all of the different stories, right, that we hear or that we come across in the, in the scriptures. And at first we started, well, we started with how God created the universe and everything in it. And that was found way back in Genesis, right? And so now we we're, we're find ourselves in the book of Samuel. And you know, some of those stories that we've, uh, we've read, by like some of them have some happy endings. Like, well, Abraham and Sarah becoming uh, parents through, well, God's gracious gift of that little baby Isaac. And then in 1 Kings, we're going to read this story where we have uh, the, the Syrian general named And there he was, he is cured of his leprosy. After years of being with the sickness, he was completely cured. And then we see him, he's just astonished, he's just amazed, you know, happy, turns to the Lord in, in thanksgiving. And then we have a story in the Gospels uh, where we have to see Jesus, he feeds 5,000 people, 5,000 hungry people out there. He feeds them with just five loaves and two fish. I mean, all those stories, all of them happy, happy endings to them. And then there are the stories that we come across in scriptures where, well, really, we don't know what the ending was. Okay? We really don't know how, how they ended. Like, well, like the story of Jonah, for instance. Hmm? Where at the, at the end of his story, there we find Jonah, he's leaning against that wall of Nineveh, and he is really angry at God. He's angry at God because God has forgiven and mercy on all those people in Nineveh that what? That repented and turned to God. You know, all those Assyrian people who Jonah really hated deep down in his gut. He just hated. He couldn't stand them. And so you see at the end of the, of the book, there's Jonah there. We see God. And you have God. And he's asking old Jonah. He says, why can't you forgive your neighbor? I forgive you. Why, why can't you do that, Jonah? We don't get any answer, though. We don't get any answer, Jonah. We are left with Jonah's silence, you see, and we don't know if Jonah stayed in that anger, if he stayed in that sin, or if he turned around and, and forgave the Assyrians. And then another story that we really don't know the ending to is, well, the parable of the prodigal son, right? The story of the prodigal son. Because right at the end of that story, if you remember, when the father asked the elder brother, he says, why, why can't you forgive your brother like, like I have forgiven you all these years? Well, like old Jonah there, that elderly brother, he doesn't answer. So, you know, once again, we're left. We're left with uh, not knowing. Left without an answer. I mean, did he stay in his anger? Did he stay in his sin? Or did he follow God? God's call and, and forgive that younger brother. You see, this question here, this question that was asked of Jonah, was asked of that uh, elder brother in the parable, this question of forgiving and loving as, as God loves, it's also asked of us. It's asked of us every day that we're out there during the week. Mm -hmm. And so we, maybe we should take a, a, a little time, maybe it isn't a bad idea this week, to ask ourselves, you know, where do we stand on this question, on this issue? I mean, do we like, uh, do we like Jonah and, and that other brother? Do we stay sty silent and, and isolated in our anger, you know, in our, in our rage and our hurt? Or... Do we turn around? Do we turn to God and ask uh, His help? You know, and do we ask His help to, and then endeavor to what? Love our neighbors. God loves us. I mean, it's a very important question for for us to answer. You might even say it's a it's life saving question to answer. And now we come to our uh, the last group, the last group of stories that we run into in the Bible. And in these stories, why they don't have a happy ending and, and their ending isn't uncertain at all. But instead, I mean, these stories have a very, very bad ending to them. It's kind of like the story of King David, for instance. King David, after he had the Uriah, uh, the Hittite, he had him murdered. So King David could take that sheep, his wife, to be, you know, his, his wife, after he murdered <clears throat> Uriah. Ever since that happened, right, David's life, you see, has never been the same when we read in the scriptures. 
me, the consequences of that sin followed him throughout his life. They, they brought tons of grief and hurt into his life. He was to the point where at one time, one of David's sons tried to kill him. Not a big happy family. Because, because what? It happened because David, what David thought was okay uh, by worldly standards is really not okay by God's standards. None of the story, another story of uh, kind of a bad ending in the story of Judas. Right? I mean, Judas was just a, a, well, he just couldn't see Jesus, you see, as God's Messiah. Judas, who thought that he might be just doing a, a really good thing, he might be saving his entire nation by turning in Jesus to authorities so that he could kill him on the cross. But later we read in the Gospels, later if you read, you'll see that, well, he finally realized what he had done. He finally feels the wrong that he did. He saw it as, as the sin that he had done. Instead of turning to God, right, and asking forgiveness, what did he do? Judas goes and turns to the very people that got him in to that mess in the first place, those priests. Instead of leading, <clears throat> leading him to see God and his forgiveness, well, they led him into a deep, deep depression. And so old Judas ran off and he committed suicide. And this brings us to our story, you see, of King Saul, which we heard today, uh, read from 1 Samuel there. Because the life of King Saul was one of those stories that had a very, very bad ending in it. Just like a Judas had there. Saul started out, he started out like most people, like most of us, just wanted to be a good person, right? We can all understand that, wanting to be what God called him to be. Like I said, isn't that just what, well, what people aspire to? They, most of us want to be just seen as a good person. Person. Of course, of course we do. And so with that mindset, you know, that Saul had, Saul, he followed God. I mean, he tore down all the pagan temples that God told him to do. He kicked out all the witches out of Israel that God told him to do. But then after a while, maybe just like kind of us, after a while, Saul starts to question the, maybe the soundness uh, of God. I maybe mean, the, the logic of God's command. He starts telling himself, you know, asking himself, oh, why did that God do this? And why did God do this? And why did that? And, and why does God let all those bad things happen anyways? I mean, it doesn't seem right to me, he kept on telling himself. It doesn't make sense to me, he told himself. I mean, how can I follow a God, you know, that's like that? And so, you know, rather than then listen to all what God has told him, you know, how, how he to solve, you know, how to live his life, well, I saw then he did only what he thought was, well, maybe it was the right way to go, okay? He did what made, uh, what only made sense to him. Isn't that sometimes, isn't that how we look at the Bible, how we use the Bible right now? I mean, God calls us to tithe, right? But we say, you know, let's not get too crazy here with that. God calls us to, to forgive everyone, but we say what? But they did the unforgivable, we tell him. And God then tells us to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and comfort those who need some comforting. And we say what? We say, well, yeah, but, I mean, they really, they really, they really deserve it because guess what? If they got themselves in this position in the first place, you know why? So why should I then try to help them? And therefore, it's not so much you see that God's commands maybe are bad. It's that you know they they don't always make sense to our little brains here, our infinite, uh, finite, limited minds. And so we have to ask ourselves. We have to ask ourselves, are we uh, now and was Saul then right in saying, you know, living like that? Are we really better, uh, make, uh, <clears throat> can we be have better decision makers, you know, than God is, you know, when it comes to choosing how we should go in life? It's kind of like, well, we have a little, a little show and tell this morning. It's real that good. about picking which way to go. Chainsaws. Fire. Yeah. If you're in a horror, 
You make poor decisions. That's what you do. You want to save 15 percent of them? There you go. Don't we always? It's so easy for us to pick those chainsaws, isn't it, huh? And so here we see that when we attempt to make important decisions, you know, in our lives, uh, totally on our own, right, without asking God for any direction, without asking for any guidance there, why then, well, like Judas, like that King Saul, we can bring upon ourselves some very, very bad endings. Because you see that sinful side of our broken human nature is why without God's guidance uh, in, in our life, we tend to do just that. We tend to pick out the worldly way to go. We tend to pick out that materialistic way to go. We tend to pick out those chainsaws. Mm -hmm. We tend to pick those things out over the security, the love, and the safety of God's loving presence in our, in our lives. But, you know, throughout all of it, how throughout our lives, the important thing to always remember for us is that what? God never, ever runs out of forgiveness and love for us. No matter how many times, you see, we reject God's, God's guidance in our lives huh, and go our own way. No matter how many times right, we go and we choose those crazy chainsaws in our lives. If we turn to the Lord, you know, if we are truly sorry for our sin and ask for forgiveness uh, that was won for us by Christ's great sacrifice on Calvary's cross, why then we can be absolutely sure, absolutely certain, 100% sure, that our sins are forgiven and forgotten. What a great blessing that is to know. How comforting is that to know? And so as Matthew in chapter 27 tells us, when Judas realized, you know, if we read on, you see that he, when Judas realized what he had done, right, he felt great remorse, it says, great sorrow. He finally hid him what he did. He went and he returned those 30 pieces of service. He went and confessed his, his sin. And Judas would have, have turned to God and done that, but God would have forgiven him. But instead, what's he do? He turns to this chainsaw. Ah, he turns to those materialistic priests there who they didn't even believe in an afterlife, uh, any life after death. Who believe that this worldly life is, is all that we get. You know, it's easy to remind, remind us of that, what they believe, because they, they were called sad new seeds, right? And what do we say? They were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in eternal life with God. These were the guys that, were, that, that, that Judas turned to. And those priests, why they told Judas, we don't, if you read the scripture, they say, we don't care that you feel bad. We don't care that you repented. So there he was. Left without hope, left without God's love and God's forgiveness, that surety, and in a deep, deep depression, he went out and, and uh, hung himself. And so once again, you know, this, this story of Judas, it brings us back to our story of Saul there, where <clears throat> we see that when Saul was in such a situation, once he was faced with a seemingly impossible situation to overcome, instead of confessing his sin right, asking for forgiveness, waiting on God's direction, waiting for God to reveal his will for him in this situation that he was in and facing, what did he do? And instead of waiting on God, my Saul goes and he turns to the witches. He turns to the spiritual uh, spirits to give him direction in his life. He turned to those spiritual chainsaws, you see, where nothing good can come, just like we saw in, in, in our video here. And we tend to think that this was just a story, oh, it happened when, about 3,000 years ago, so oh, it doesn't have anything to do with us. You don't have to think about it. But what did I show you about, what was it, about two months ago, maybe? Two and a half months ago? Remember about Show and Tell? Show those, they have witches' magazines. You can buy it at any, any bookstore uh, near any college campus in the, in the country. You probably can get it on the coffee shops. They're all through the campuses. And in every church I've been in, there's been someone who knows someone in their family that's been into this thing. It's a pervasive thing. This is exactly what we are facing out there. What we tend to think, oh, 
Forget about it. We don't have to worry about that. It's all around us if you just only take the time and talk to people. And we face that, that same stuff, huh? That same stuff which then brought what? Brought Saul only hurt and only anxiety into our life. Taking away, you see, all that hope for the future. That hope for the future in Christ is what makes us sane in this crazy world. Driving then old Saul to suicide, just like with Judas. A very, very bad ending. Hmm? And so maybe the question for us as we read these stories is, well, how do we keep those very, very bad endings from becoming part of our ending? Well, you know, we say, as you said earlier, don't we all want to be seen as a good person when we're out there, right? And so we look to Jesus for that. Let's look to Jesus to find out how we can be seen as a, a good person, a righteous person in the eyes of God. And Jesus tells us, he says that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life. And anyone who follows his teaching will never die, but have eternal life. And then in John 13, our Lord tells us, he says, A new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. So go out there and love one another, he says. Because by this, guess what? Everybody's going to know you're my disciples. If you love one another. Because he says, because for I have come but to give you joy, to make your joy complete, and this is how you do it. You see? To give you that happy ending. And St. Paul also tells us in 1 Thessalonians, be joyful in Jesus always. So when we're out there, be joyful in Jesus always. Someone will ask you, what's the matter with you? Why are you always happy? Why are you letting all this stuff head? Why are you happy when all this stuff's coming around you, going around you? tell them, because you have the joy of Christ in your heart. Right? You know how it's all going to come out in the end. You know, we have a letter. It was written by a Roman citizen, and this letter was written, uh, it's written way back uh, uh, in the year 250 about, which is about 20 years right after Jesus died and went up into heaven, right? And Christianity is first coming around into all the Roman Empire there. And it says, he writes, this guy writes, he says, this is a broken world, he says, it's an incredibly broken world. <laughs> and when we look out at the news today, can't we relate to that, huh? All that stuff that's going on out there. But he continues, he says, but I've discovered something, he says, I discovered that in the middle of all this craziness, why, there is this group of people, this quiet, holy group of people, and they have learned this great secret, he says. And this great secret they have found gives them joy, a joy that is a thousand times better, greater than any pleasure that this crazy world out there, this materialistic world, can give us that we're always looking for, you know? He says they are yet they're despised, he says, you know, they're persecuted, but they don't care. Why? Because they overcome the world. He says that these people are Christians, and I'm happy I'm one of them, he writes. And he ends it that way. We're Christians. We've overcome all this craziness you see out there. And then in Philippians 4, Paul explains this joyful secret, right, that this fellow is talking about in this letter. Uh, this, that Jesus would have all of us live in, huh? This joyful secret. When he says, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true and whatever is noble and whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, he says, always keep these in the forefront of your little brain. Always be thinking of this. Always be acting this way. He says, he says and put them into practice in your life. And what will happen then, he says. And then the God of peace will be with you always. Not a little bit, not today, but tomorrow. Always that God of peace will be with you. That's what everybody's looking for, aren't they, out there? And so that is a very, very joyful ending.